This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Extinction. Oh, it's such an ugly word. When we apply that to wildlife or a wild plant, it really makes us wonder, what do we do to let that happen? Fortunately, for the American chestnut tree, it's not extinct, and it never will be if the dedicated folks at the American Chestnut Foundation have their say about it. We go inside outdoors with an update on a tree that was once king of the forest. Could be again. Next on Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky has some troubled waters. Sailing in a sewer all the way. Boaters dumping waste overboard when no one's looking ruins the day for everyone, fish included. So use an approved dump station. Sailing in a sewer all the day. Dilution is not the solution. Use your holding tank wisely or hold it in. A message from your Kentucky wildlife and boating officers. Who's ready for a boatload of laughs? Give it up for Funny Sunny! Thanks. I found it. A use for a life jacket. A pillow! (laughs) Hey, I'm not going to wear a life jacket. I know how to swim. (laughs) How can it hurt you? It's just water. (laughs) It's just hysterical. Funny Sunny, everyone. She'll be here all week. Maybe. Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. Hey there, my name is Charlie Baglin, and welcome to Kentucky Fuel Radio. I've noticed something in this job as a talk show host. Topics may stay the same over the years, but the voices I talk to change. On the subject of the demise and the hopeful rejuvenation of the American chestnut tree, several faces have remained steadfast and true. We open the show with a radio report. This dates back to 2004 when this Kentucky Field radio program wasn't an hour long, but just five minutes. You'll recognize my voice as host. In it also are Mr. Rex Mann from the U.S. Forest Service and wildlife biologist Scott Friedhoff. They'll be in after the report for an update. But we listen to the audio archive first because it's easier to know where we're going if we first know where we've been. Once upon a time in a land very close to home. The story, next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Kentucky has 11,900,000 acres of forest. That's almost half a state. Making up those forests are 120 different species of trees. Easy to believe if one was taken away, it's no major loss. We still have 119. But what happened in the 1920s and 1930s was major, and it affected just one tree, which happened to be the biggest tree and what most considered the best tree. It lived in New England to the deep south and deep in the heart of many Kentuckians. The black killed them all out in 1939 in Kentucky. If you were born since the Second World War, you have no memory of these things. And these things are called the American Chestnut Tree. We go inside outdoors with Rex Mann. Rex is with the U.S. Forest Service in Winchester and is the president of the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. 20-25% of all the trees in the overstory were chestnuts. When the chestnut died, basically the oaks inherited that growing space. But the oaks were not able to produce the same quantities of mass. The overall amount of wildlife food available in the forest went down. It was a loss that we never made up. Not uncommon for these trees to get well over 100 foot tall. It outgrew everything else in the woods. Some of these things would have taken five to seven people to reach around them. There were some early efforts to bring in some of the uh, first cousins of the American chestnut because they produced bigger nuts for the nut industry. And unfortunately, it was on some of these seedlings that had come in from Japan that the blight also came in. It was one of the first of the invasive exotics that we have in this country. Invasive exotics are plants, in this case a fungus, that have made their way to an area out of its home range. 
but the animals, insects, or other mechanisms that kept it in check in its home range did not come with it. As a consequence, it grows out of control, such as kudzu. What's peculiar is that the forest is still full of American chestnut trees, but they are no longer the towering, flowering giant. When all those original big trees were killed by the fungus, they re-sprouted. They have an interesting adaptation where they'll form buds at the base of the tree just under the soil line. So if anything happens to the tree itself, these buds will sprout and form a new tree. So that basically has spared the chestnut from an extinction, really. Scott Friedhoff is a Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife biologist, also active in the Chestnut Foundation. Many people would refer to it as the redwood of the east because it grew to such a large size. When I went to work for the Forest Service, all that was left were the gray ghosts in the forest. A lot of them stood for decades after the black killed them. When my dad would talk about it, there'd be tears in his eyes. He would remember what the people felt when it died. Not only was the wood elegant in appearance, but extraordinarily rot-resistant, sort of nature's own version of pressure-treated lumber. Man truly can be the great destroyer, but we're also the great restorers. It's not fair to see species disappear. If we can intervene and prohibit that, it is the right thing to do for those who come after us. We have an obligation to do that. Not to do so is to consign additional species to extinction. Kentucky Field Radio is a broadcast service of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, your partner in the great outdoors. We are back in the studio with the same two gentlemen from the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. What comes to mind as we talk today about Kentucky forests? One of the things that really saddened me when I uh, retired from the Forest Service was the number of trees that we are losing to uh, exotic insects and diseases. You know, from from where we sit right here, for example, if you went north from here and even south some from here and you look for ash trees, you, you, you're going to find that they're all dead from a, an exotic beetle that's moving southward and it's probably going to take them all out before it's over with. If you go very far south of here, particularly into Tennessee and North Carolina and you look for hemlock trees, you're going to find they're all dead. While that wasn't a major timber tree, it's what kept our trout streams cool enough for Mm -hmm. trout to reproduce. Uh, Seems to be no end to that list. Butternut has a a problem. Uh, Our beach has a a beach bark disease. Uh, The elms that we once had on our city streets are almost all dead. We've got gypsy moth. We've got a new disease that has shown up in Tennessee that has the potential to really do away with the walnuts, the black walnut trees, and the most uh, fearsome one, I think, is a uh, disease called a sudden oak death out that's now localized out in the coast of Northern California. That if that thing ever got here, it could really devastate our forest. But uh, this whole story started with the chestnut which succumbed to the blight uh, over a century ago. Well, aren't there other trees that are producing nuts for bear and deer and turkey? Yes, but, you know, out of those 120 or so trees that we've got, you could probably narrow that down to 25 to 30 trees that are commonly part of the canopy in Kentucky. Explain what canopy means. Those are the trees. Those are the big trees, the trees that can compete and grow and and form the forest canopy above all the other trees. Trees like, you know, white oak and sugar maple, American beech, tulip poplar or yellow poplar, our state tree. That's one of the big trees out there. And I've noticed in years like this year, when acorns are mostly absent from the forest, oaks just simply didn't produce much of an acorn crop to feed wildlife this fall and winter. So what we have left are, we still have ash trees in East Kentucky, and those seeds are important to turkeys and to even the small mammals like chipmunks. They'll eat those this time of year. And also 
Our state tree, the tulip poplar, it drops seeds continually over the winter. And those seeds fall down, land on top of the snow or on top of the leaf litter. And so turkeys definitely are looking for those. And uh, so when you when you remove some trees from the canopy, like the chestnut or maybe in the future like the walnut or the beech, there's just less out there to eat. So reducing the diversity of our forest trees is going to negatively impact wildlife. The efforts in place for the recovery of a forest giant, the American chestnut tree. A break and then more. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Rex Mann and Scott Friedhoff with the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation are in the studio with me. Maybe you remember a story recently in the news about Johnny Depp. He was filming a movie in Australia, and he took his dogs with him, and they quarantined the dogs. But they did this for good reason. They wanted to keep any diseases the dogs had out. Now, had this been the case in the United States, and had it been a 100 years ago, as it applied to trees and agriculture, we probably wouldn't be having the conversation that we're having now about the American chestnut. What year did this disease surface? The chestnut blight uh, was first noted about 1904, and uh, I think it was the Bronx uh, Botanical Gardens, New York City. took just a little while to identify that this is a fungus that our trees had no resistance to. And it spread southward and northward. There were some valiant efforts to stop the blight, but uh, none of them worked. And basically, by the time of the Second World War, it was pretty well wiped out, the whole Appalachian chain. So from 1904 to 19... Let's call it 40. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 35 I, years in there. This fungus came in, and there was no defending it. That's the only tree, though, that this blight did affect, was the American chestnut. Yeah, it also affected a couple of first cousins, the Allegheny chinkapin. And, and when you get west of the Mississippi, there is an Ozark chinkapin that in some places gets tree size, and it also was affected by the blight. And Scarlet Oak is the only one I know of that is an alternate host, and it does not kill that tree, but it enables the chestnut blight to reproduce. What's interesting, though, gentlemen, is that the American chestnut still exists in our forest. We're talking using terms like it died out that it was wiped out, that it's gone. They still exist, but in a very diminutive form. Tell me about it, this. For some unknown reason, it does not kill the roots of the tree. And chestnut was a prolific sprouter. So we have trees in some cases that for a century or perhaps even more have been uh, continually putting up sprouts from uh, these uh, trees that had been killed earlier. When they get up sapling size, they almost always contact the blight and, and they die back. So it's basically reduced a tree that was once king of the forest, if you will, to a fairly insignificant shrub in the understory right now. Yeah, they sit there in the shade for decades, resprouting when that stem is killed. And in Letcher County, we when we were working with a tree there to try and pollinate it, we found some of those giant stump rings, we call them. The chestnut wood is very rot resistant, so we would find these six and seven foot diameter stump rings sticking up through the leaf litter. And the reason we knew that they were chestnuts is because they'd have a, a viable living sprout coming up out of the edge of that, that stump ring. And You call those stump sprouts? That's correct, stump sprouts. And I don't think it would be too out of line to suggest there's probably millions of American chestnuts still out there in the forest, but they can only exist as sprouts for the most part, unless there's some sort of disturbance to the canopy trees where more sunlight can get down to the forest floor to where these stump sprouts are, are sitting there in the shade. And once they get that sunlight, whether it be 
an ice storm, a tornado, a timber harvest. Uh, some of the best places to find American chestnuts is uh, 10 years after a timber harvest because th- those stump sprouts will get the sunlight they need and they'll grow as fast as even faster than most of the trees around them. So they become very noticeable in a young forest. I heard of a story about an American chestnut tree being found in all of its glory in the state of Maine. Does that offer some hope? The thing to keep in mind, I think, is that uh, this is pretty close to the northern edge of the range. And, And what I understand is that this tree was spotted uh, by someone in an airplane that were looking for for trees that that were flowering. And it's been carefully measured, and the thing uh, is 115 foot tall, which gives you... Now, this is cold, frigid Maine, if you will. And it was not unusual at all for that tree to reach heights like that in, uh, let's say, the southern Appalachians or Pennsylvania. It just, it's just a tribute to the tree of what it could do. That, uh, as far as we know, there is nothing. There is nothing about that tree that would make us think that it's uh, resistant to the blight. I think perhaps the most significant thing is it's close to the edge of the range, and there's less blight up there. It had to make you feel good when you heard that news, and I bet you heard about it with the American Chestnut Foundation, didn't just got before. Maybe the rest of the world knew. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we we tend to hear about those big trees um, a little sooner, probably. Yeah. Now, isn't there a grove of trees in Wisconsin that also is growing intact? It's just just as if it were a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, yeah, I've been to that place a couple of times, and uh, I'll tell you what happened there. Uh, Back about the turn of the last century, around 1900, maybe just a few years before, uh, a settler brought in somewhere seven to ten chestnuts and planted the seed. And these things did very well. This is west of the uh, range of American chestnut in, in Wisconsin. But they did very well. Over a period of uh, roughly a century, the uh, uh, the tree came to dominate that private tract of woodland there, probably as much as 50% of the canopy trees or the trees that were dominating uh, were American chestnut. Sadly, somewhere along the line, the blight found that uh, stand of trees and... Uh, and there is a, a good deal of research going on uh, at this site right now, but uh, the blight, the stand is blighted, and uh, the blight has uh, knocked out a good many of the trees. You had made a statement once to me in an earlier program, Rex Man. You said, we have an obligation to try to restore this tree. Not to do so would be to assign additional species to extinction. That's profound. So trying to keep this tree alive and trying to keep hopes alive and research alive that will restore the tree. Another quote you had said, if we can do that, it would rank as one of the greatest restoration efforts in U.S. history. As Scott can attest to, there have been some very, very significant restoration efforts made for wildlife, for a turkey, for a white-tailed deer. But when you get in the realm of forest trees, nothing like what we're attempting to do has ever been accomplished. I, I gave you a litany of, of the trees we're losing. And, and, you know, when you look at this doom and gloom picture, there's one ray of hope. What's that? And that's what's going on with the American chestnut tree. I don't have a doubt in my mind that while I may not live to see the job completed, we are going to bring this tree back. And the only way we'll bring back other species that we're losing in our forest today is going to be by a similar effort. Scott, take us back to where restoration efforts began and the belief was there that you could breed blight resistance into the American chestnut. When did all that get started? 
The name of that strategy is called the back cross breeding. If you have a problem in, in one plant, you can possibly breed genes into that plant from another plant that will help it overcome the problem, whatever it may be. Now, in general, I know that it's been used on grain crops like wheat, but of course wheat grows quickly and produces seed quickly, so you could probably produce more than one generation a wheat crop in one year. Back cross breeding can go rather quickly, but the basic idea is you take you take your your original wheat plant, you cross it with whatever other plant you want your resistance from, and you have a 50-50 hybrid. So you take your 50-50 hybrid and you back cross to your to additional wheat plants, just pure wheat plants, at least three times in this current strategy. And in the end, you have you have a wheat plant that looks and acts and functions like a wheat plant should, except that in each generation, you're choosing, you're selecting for that resistance that you want to the problem. So that's what's been done with the chestnut tree. And and at each uh, at each generation with the chestnut tree, though, it's it takes probably seven, eight, ten years rather than multiple generations in one year. Gents, we'll hold it there. A fishing report is standing by, and then more about where the American chestnut tree stands today. My name is Charlie Backlund. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. into our second half hour here on Kentucky Field Radio. If you would like to hear this show again or email the link to someone that would be interested in the chestnut tree, share it on Facebook if you'd like. The first place I would send you to find the link is Facebook. Just go to the search box, put in Kentucky Field Radio, and you will find us right there. You can also check us out on YouTube, myhuntingandfishing.com, and go to iTunes. We are also a weekly podcast. More on the chestnut tree just ahead. First up, our fishing report. This is Tom with your fishing report from the Northeast. Cave Run Lake is still running slightly above summer pool with temperatures in the middle 60s. The lake moving up and down over the last couple of weeks has scattered the bass out a little bit. You'll still be fishing shallow, but now you'll be focusing on some of the flooded areas or any woody structure that you can find on the shorelines. Fish creature baits, jigs, and shallow running crankbaits to land some of these bass. Crappie were still holding tight onto brush and structure on the main lake, and most good reports coming in are on jigs fished into that structure. You need to be relying pretty heavily on your electronics to see if there are fish on those piles before you fish them. Some piles have been very hot, while others have been holding very few fish. The bluegill spawn would be happening on all of our smaller lakes, including farm ponds. Some lakes to focus on would be Lake Reba in Madison County or any of our Fins lakes. That should do it for us. Wherever you go, good luck and stay safe. Hi, this is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Most lakes are back down to summer pool in this area, with some being muddy, though. If looking for clear water to fish, head to the lower ends of lakes. Largemouth bass fishing has been slow the past week with the earlier flooding and also fish on beds. Paintsville and Yatesville lakes having better water near dam and having some better bass fishing there. Trout stockings at tailwaters below dams for May have not occurred yet due to flooding. Looking for these stockings to occur around May 20th or after. Crappie fishing still good for male. Guarding nest and fry. Clear water and lower end of fish trap lake having some good fish caught. Small plastic minnows or crankbaits pulled through nest areas getting aggressive hits. Car Creek Lake has finally got to summer pool and some walleye being caught shallow in new covered shoreline areas with bottom bouncing crankbaits. Hi, this is John Williams with the Fish Report for Southeast Kentucky. At Lake Cumberland, the lake has jumped significantly in the last week or so with the heavy rains. Parts of the lake are, are muddy to murky. Slowed down fishing a little bit, but there are some nice bass being caught, smallmouth and largemouth, at least some of those on crankbaits. Let's give that a try. Also, below Lake Cumberland, Hatchery Creek has recently opened a new section, and they're catching trout, all three species, in the new part of the Hatchery Creek. Seems like woolly boogers are the ticket. Uh, other small nymphs, especially yellow and white or red and white. Finally, uh, we're stocking trout this week at War Fork, Bark Camp, Cane, and Laurel Tailwaters. Those can be caught on small spinners or small crankbaits. As always, good luck and good fishing. 
It's easy to use fishing cliches in commercials. Catch memories. Hook some fun. Or you'll love it. Hook, line, and sinker. So with the catch phrases out of the way, next time you go fishing, ask someone to go with you. See if we take the bait. Introduce them to what you love so much. After all, we already know the terminology. Now they just need to know how. Fishing. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife can help. Log on to fw.ky.gov. How was the wedding? I cried like a baby. Good thing you wore your life jacket. They say you can drown in a teaspoon of water. Makes you think twice about that next cup of coffee. Honey, I'll be outside washing the car. Life jacket. Before you break a sweat. Before your next sad movie. Wear your life jacket. Put on your life jacket and help with the dishes. Life jackets. You know when they're a stupid idea. You should know when they're not. Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. Time, patience, money, expertise, maybe holding your mouth just right. One thing for sure, success isn't overnight. This is Charlie Baglin. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. The American Chestnut Foundation, Kentucky Chapter, has Rex Mann and Scott Friedhoff with me today. We're discussing this hour the gains that have been made in restoring a tree that was once king of the forest, not just here in Kentucky, but all along the eastern seaboard, the American chestnut tree. Patience pays, and you can dedicate a lifetime to this. And yeah. and people have. Uh, Fred Hebbard with the uh, American Chestnut Foundation, he, he was there in the beginning and just recently retired, but they have reached that point where they are producing nuts that have gone back into the forest for testing. I read about one of those in the small town of Tryon, North Carolina. So was that an official planting that they believed that they would be blight-resistant? We've got some of our trees that this coming year will be going through about the fifth growing season, perhaps, and yeah. they're planted on maybe even the sixth. And these these are on the national forests, and I think they're in North Carolina and Virginia and Tennessee, if I remember right. And they're kind of keeping these places secret or trying to because concern that people might uh, go in there to try to get some of the nuts off the trees or so forth. But... Uh, so it's been held pretty close, but they have gone through a number of growing seasons and uh, and really looking pretty good. It was believed in 2002, because Scott, you and I had had a conversation some years ago, that the trees that will be repopulating the forest are in the ground now. And by 2007, the nuts that you could take out to the forest and plant, it was believed it was going to be a done deal by 2007. Here's where we are. We have a research farm down in Virginia uh, where a lot of the research is uh, is going on. But we also have parallel breeding programs in almost every state where the chestnut once grew. For example, we have a chapter here in Kentucky, and in almost all the states where chestnut grew, we have state chapters that are doing a parallel breeding program. And, and simple reason for this is when we repopulate the forests of Kentucky with chestnut, we want to have genes from Kentucky in these trees. So, sure. In other words, we look for surviving Kentucky trees to produce the final trees that will be used to replant Kentucky. Now, our national program at Meadowview, Virginia, is already producing nuts, and these are the nuts that have been outplanted uh, in the national forest sites that I mentioned a while ago. And these nuts hope to be blight resistant? The initial hope was that 100% of all these nuts would be blight resistant. That was the breeding plan that was put together by Dr. Charles Burnham in the early 80s. And I think what it's fair to say that what we're finding now, the science of genetics has advanced greatly in the intervening 32 years or so, where we initially thought that perhaps there were two genes that could give this blight resistance. We now know that there's probably more that have some part to play. The bottom line is we're looking closely to see what percentage of these nuts that are being produced right now will, in fact, have a level of blight resistance that will let them grow and succeed in the woods. 
don't know exactly what that number is, but it's it's significant. It's not going to be a showstopper if every one of these chestnut trees uh, is not totally uh, resistant to the blight. If they grew to 100 feet, they grow now to about 15 feet. If you had a chestnut tree that grew to 50 feet, would that be successful? Some percentage, probably somewhere 25, 50 percent, perhaps even more, as we continue to uh, clean our orchards and really look at the product we've got. A fairly high percentage of these trees is going to, in our opinion, be blight resistant, and they're going to grow just like the original chestnut trees did in that site. Now, in the business of forestry, if I have uh, an area of land that I want to plant chestnut trees on, we always plant more than what the site can sustain over a long period of time. Knowing that a few no, are going to die. Some of them are going to die or some of them will, will, will not do well. So it's, it's normal forestry practice to, to plant more trees than you'll ever have there 100 years from that time, for example. So you expect to lose some, and and uh, I don't think this is going to significantly affect how we go about the business of restoring the American chestnut tree. Scott, you were saying there is a range of blight resistance in the trees that you see now, right? The specific trees we're referring to are the the end product from this back cross breeding program. Um, theoretically, uh, they they should have all had good blight resistance from the original Chinese parent, but still exhibited all the American traits that we wanted. Um, so that they, they haven't all proven to be great at blight resistance. The continuing work now is to use just the best blight resistant trees in those seed orchards at the research farms in Virginia and let them intercross and produce the nuts that will go into the forest again for testing. So even though that goal of producing these nuts that go back in the forest occurred in 2007, it's still in the testing phase. There's still a lot of refinement and improvement that needs to happen. So it's a very long-term process. I would imagine there was some disappointment there on the side of the scientists. There would have to be some disappointment, but as scientists, you're dealing with two things. A hypothesis that you expect that this will happen, so you do the experiment and see if it actually does, and you're dealing with some mathematics, which are finite. How do you reconcile the two? I think I think it's fair to say that all of us realize that it, this restoration was going to take a very long time. And we also knew, and we have known for some time, that the breeding program was going to continue even past the time that we started actually planting the tree in the forest. A number of reasons for that. One of them is that diseases can mutate, and we wanted to be sure that we... Uh, as we continually produce better trees, we stay a jump ahead of what any disease. It's sort of like the flu shot. You know, Absolutely. the flu changes Absolutely. year to year, and so you have to yeah. try to use your best guess, best estimate of what the flu shot should be this year. It, it is fair to say that the breeding program will continue. There, there's a number of different uh, chestnut species in Asia. There are a few that we want to take the resistance from these trees and incorporate it into the breeding program that we now have going on. Continually, we'll be producing better trees as we go along. But the job is so huge that as soon as we're able to begin the restoration project process, we're going to do that. I was sitting in on your quarterly meeting earlier today, and I kept hearing the term, in quotes, high level of blight resistance. Can you quantify that, how high is high level? Uh, when we talk about a blight resistant tree, it doesn't mean that that tree won't get the blight, but it will not significantly affect its growth or it won't kill it. Is that close enough to satisfy the foundation? I think we would all be happy to see that right now. And, and as time goes along and if we could produce a better tree, that's even more resistant, and then that's our plan. 
a certain percentage of the back cross trees are expressing good blight resistance. So the, the goal now is just to increase the, the proportion that can survive the blight once they're out in the forest. How do you two feel about the years that you have put into this? Have there been enough setbacks to say maybe this just wasn't worth it? Maybe it's for brighter minds? Or are you going to go go on into your senior years and say, I had a hand in this, and I can see that it's working? i tell you what I think of uh, every day, Charlie, is nothing like this, as far as I know, has ever been attempted. And if you love the woods, there is no question this is a noble effort. This is worth chasing. I believe that it's uh, going to succeed, and... Uh, Otherwise, I wouldn't be still fooling with it. So the answer to your question... Uh, so you're pleased with the results you're seeing? Absolutely. Enough to keep climbing absolutely. the ladder? It's very hopeful for me. Uh, I, I don't have a doubt in my mind that it's going gonna, it's gonna to succeed. Could I say maybe it's like you're breeding a corn plant to produce more ears of corn, or you want to produce a, an orange tree that produces more oranges. You keep crossbreeding and going back and forth, and sooner or later you get that. Is is it that simple? Agriculture does this with regularity, don't they, Scott? They do. They sure do. And and we've all benefited from from those kinds of, of research projects and plant breeding. It will take time, but eventually we'll benefit by having the American chestnut tree back out there, too. Rex was excited to tell me when he first visited that stand of American chestnuts that had been planted in Wisconsin outside of the original range of the blight that and, and of the tree itself that, you know, he reached down and picked up a handful of nuts that were laying on the ground underneath those trees in the fall. And, you know, that's that's exciting. That's what that's what keeps us motivated is, you know, someday we want to we want to walk through a, a six inch layer of, yeah. of burrs and nuts in the forest. That will be, and even if we don't get to do that ourselves, someone will, and 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 they're going to really appreciate it. I personally want my grandchildren and my great grandchildren, Charlie, to have an opportunity to know this tree. It, it's absolutely a part of our history, a part of our culture, and uh, we just have to do this. Two of the longtime pros with the American Chestnut Foundation, Kentucky Chapter, are my guests today. Back with some final thoughts after the break. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Into our final few minutes with Rex Mann and Scott Freithoff, two longtime proponents of the recovery of the American chestnut tree. Gentlemen, from where you're sitting, you take a look behind me up on this top shelf, you can see a photo of a young man sitting at his microscope at his laboratory, and that was at Cornell University back in 2007. That's my stepson, Dr. Michael Hayes. He's a specialist in biochemistry, molecular and cellular biology, a lot of things that are really over my head. A genetics guy, we call him. (laughs) He's now a professor in L.A. But I dissect things by talking. He uses a laboratory. But he, like you, has a knack for this type of thing. His mother would tell me about how he and his grandfather would go out into the garden and work together. And Mike liked to do experiments. Not really sure of his age, maybe 10, maybe, there in his backyard garden in Lexington. But the plant biology bug bit him early on. He would crossbreed, I don't know, one plant with another and somehow render blue corn. (laughs) Science class kind of things. But he always had an interest in the American chestnut tree. I hope that his kids, Pam's and my grandkids, can grow up one day to see this tree back in the Kentucky forest. I wish we could just call Ortho and say, could you create a fungicide to kill the blight? Yeah, you know, that's something nice now with the hemlock tree. We can we can purchase chemicals or insecticides in particular for hemlocks and the ash tree. We can inject those in a liquid form into the soil around the base of the tree, and we can keep those those trees alive. And that is something that they just didn't have access to back in, you know, the early 1900s when the chestnut was being attacked. 
Well, that could have made a real difference right there. Sure, sure. The American Chestnut Foundation, specifically the Kentucky chapter, depends heavily, mightily, on volunteers. I heard in your meeting a while ago you need people to go to the forest to do you know, Project A, B, or C, pollination, and count the number of trees doing whatever it might be. What do you say to people that may entice a young student that's interested in biology and forestry to take part in your programs? I think the generation of young people uh, in school right now are basically no different from uh, past generations. And I think that we can appeal to those folks. And I would say that if you, you are the generation that may very well live to see this restoration succeed it's going to take a long time but if you really want to leave some tracks if you really want to do something for the generations that come after there is no more worthy project that I can think of than to restore something a major tree in the forest that everybody thought was gone forever the way I think about that issue is There's only going to be so many of us who take an interest in the chestnut tree or in the hemlock tree or the ash tree. But first, they they have to hear about it. And so uh, education, anytime we have an opportunity to tell the chestnut story, we definitely take advantage of it as a chapter, as as do most of the state or all of the state chapters. We we really uh, try to share that story, especially with younger people. And I had an opportunity back in the summer of 2014 with the high school students in the Governor's Scholars Program at Moorhead State University. Uh, We took a couple of those classes down to the American Chestnut Tree Orchard at the Morgan County Nursery. Even though I may have only had a half hour to talk about chestnuts, they, they got to see the chestnuts and hear that story. So if one out of those 40 students takes an interest in chestnuts, that's important. And That's, that's one more than you have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The American Chestnut Foundation, I don't know much about its budget, but if somebody wanted to learn more about you or do anything to contribute, are there options available? Absolutely. We have a website, acf.org where you can get contact information uh, and learn just about anything uh, you need to know. We're very anxious to uh, let people know about this project. That would be the best way. There's information there on your website, I trust, for high school, middle school, elementary school. Any type of teacher could grab hold of this, work it into their lesson plans if they so chose. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. and, and there are those resources available on the website for teachers specifically to to introduce their students to it. It is noble work that you're doing, and I wish it was as easy as breeding the color black with the color white and getting gray, and you're done. But <laughs> clearly it's not. <laughs> but I, I certainly hope that it is within sight now, because you've worked too long for it not to be. It's great effort that's gone into this. One of the nice things about working with chestnut trees is talking to people who have had experiences with chestnut trees in the past or or had grandparents or uh, some ancestor that had some sort of experience with chestnuts and and shared that story. And I had a call from a gentleman in Breathitt County. He said that his grandmother, when she was a little girl, she went out with her father to squirrel hunt so they could have some food for supper. They had the family dog with them, and they went up on on the hill there in Breathitt County, and the dog tangled with a mountain lion. And to protect themselves from the mountain lion, his grandmother and her father actually jumped into a big hollowed-out chestnut tree. The tree was so big, it had a big hollow in it, and they actually climbed into that hollow to escape from the mountain lion. That had to be a big tree. (laughs) You're talking about six, seven feet around? Yeah, so when you hear those stories, and there's so many of them out there, you know, it it really just adds to the work that we're doing. Someday, you know, we know we're going to have those big trees back. Gentlemen, Rex, Scott, we appreciate your optimism, and good luck with this. There is a website where you can learn more. ACF, for American Chestnut Foundation, ACF 
org. There you can sign up for a free newsletter, job opportunities, volunteer opportunities, news. You can donate. You can check the history. You can learn about the tree state by state. This is an active effort. You don't just plant a tree and then kick back for 10 years. There is something going on with this project all the time, and the calendar of events link is pretty cool. You should check it out, acf.org. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Thank you.